Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, this 3.30 panel on secondary offer networks. So this is really a panel about the download business. Um, the name isn't as quite as descriptive, but um, what we're talking about here is software distribution, free software, how it's monetized, how it's promoted, <coughs> and just all, all about this business. So um, we have some great panelists here. Uh, myself, I'm Dave McCarthy. I'm the general manager of Download Admin and uh, it's part of Tightrope Interactive, and, and we are a secondary offer network. So we work with some of the biggest publishers in the world, Yahoo Downloads is one. We have a lot of our own owned and operated sites, and we monetize free software downloads. That's, that's what our business does. <clears throat> Let's go right into our, our panelists here. So first up, Andrew Moores, president of the Ask Partner Network and OfferCast. Hi, everyone. Do you want, should we say something? Or? Sure, yeah. Okay. If you want. Um, <clears throat> my name is Andrew Moores. I'm president of uh, the Ask Partner Network, which is part of the uh, Search and Applications Division of IAC. Um, we are a leader in the search and downloadable application space, um, working with a uh, few hundred partners, and um, we've got more than 100 million uh, end user customers worldwide. Um, we um, <clears throat> work with some of the largest uh, downloadable software companies uh, in the world, Oracle, Symantec, um, and others, um, and we support their monetization and distribution via our uh, custom toolbar platform, custom search solutions, and uh, OfferCast, which is our leading um, installer and secondary offer platform. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Balin Rhymes, the VP of Revenue and Ad Ops for Anchor Free. I'm Bala Nurhan Rhymes. I'm the head of revenue and monetization for Anchor Free. Our product, Hotspot Shield, is the world's largest consumer based virtual private network enabled for privacy and security of the online users. Since our launch, we've been downloaded 100 million times worldwide. We see our addressable market as 1.6 billion users needing privacy and security online. And to achieve this goal, we partner with secondary download secondary download channels to uh, achieve monetization and distribution. Great, thank you, Valen. And last, Jasmine Modell, the SVP of Marketing for PalTalk. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me. <laughs> I'm Jasmine and I work at PalTalk, um, which is the largest video chat community, uh, which has been downloaded over 150 million times. Um, we are, most of our revenue is generated by our desktop application, uh, which we monetize via subscription upsell, virtual currency, advertising, and bundle offers, uh, primarily toolbars, which we've been running for about 10 years. Great. So um, just a show of hands, who here in the room works in the download business? Okay, looks like all of you sat on this side of the room, which should make it really easy to uh, address those questions to you. Um, so I want to see, you know, who's involved with it, who's, you know, really in the know, and, and it seems like there's a lot of people who, who are possibly new to it. So I'm going to give a little walkthrough of kind of what this industry is, and then we'll get right into the question. So let me just show you right now. This is our deal. We power Yahoo Downloads. So if a user goes to Yahoo Downloads and is downloading a free piece of software, you can see Web Install. That's an install manager that we branded for them. First office offer is for the advanced antivirus. That's the primary product the user is going there to download. The next offer is for a Yahoo toolbar. No surprise, right? This is Yahoo. Next offer after that is WeCare. Then the installation takes place of all three products, and, and that's it. That's, that's the business right there. And that is a billion dollar industry. The biggest players in the world, Google, Yahoo, Ask, they're all big time into this. And it's a, just a huge, huge market and it's growing all the time. It's also wildly unpredictable, and there's big changes happening all the time. So, um, you know, it's really exciting, and there's a lot going on, and, uh, you know, there should be a lot that we can talk about here today. 
Here's another example using the Ask Partner net Network. This is CPUID, just an example of, of a standalone product, not a directory site. And you can see here the user's going through the verbose installer, then an offer for the Ask toolbar, then PC Optimizer Pro, and then that, that completes the, um, the installation process. So um, we're going to get into the questions now. I want anybody in the audience, <coughs> feel free to ask questions right out of the gate. I don't want to wait until the Q&A. Um, I think a good panel is one that gets the panelists and the audience involved as early as you can. So if you have a question, you can either raise your hand or just head right over to the microphone. Everything's being recorded. We'd love to hear you loud and clear on the mic. So um, please feel free to, to ask any questions you might have. So with that, let's get, uh, let's get into the questions. They asked us all to sit down together for camera, but I see I'm being blocked now, so I apologize. <laughs> Uh, but first off, let's start with the publishers. So, you know, we just saw Yahoo Downloads. They're a, an obvious large publisher. Yahoo Downloads gets tons of traffic. Andrew, who, who else are the big publishers in this space? <clears throat> really, it's, I mean, anyone who um, is a large distributor of downloadable software. So some of the largest players are um, Oracle with Java, Real, Net Real Networks with the Real Player, um, a lot of the large PC security companies. Um, then there are a lot of folks in the game space, so um, downloadable social games, um, other software utilities like media management applications, um, file conversion, things like that, and then you know, download sites, places that you go to to download software. Um, there are also a number of companies that work with open source software, mm -hmm. um, so you don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel to the extent that you can package it up in a unique way for consumers. That's a real value add. Um, so, you know, I think that's kind of good range of the types of companies that play in the space. Yeah, and that's, that was going to be my follow-up there is if you're, if one of these people out here is, a, is an affiliate marketer but not in the download space and they wanted to get into this space, what's kind of a low barrier of entry way to get in? Um, you know, like I said, I guess open source software is, is a way to do it, but yeah. I mean, I wouldn't advise going and you know, being too low barrier in that, you know, you really want to build something that's got value to the consumer, um, you know, and then really you have to figure out how to market it. And I think everyone here is, you know, understands that or is learning about that here at the conference. But, you know, you really need to focus on building high quality traffic through the various channels that are available. Um, and then, you know, figure out how to monetize it to the extent that it's, you know, in today's world, a lot of software is offered for free. Um, so search and, and other you know, offers uh, made available via a reputable secondary offer network will help you, um, you know, really be able to build a business around a core uh, package of software. Yeah. And um, for these open source publishers <coughs> and, and games publishers, which I think also is probably a pretty low barrier of entry, there's lots of games out there yeah. for, for licensing, how are they driving traffic? Um, I mean, via a number of, of avenues. It's not really my expertise. We're supporting it, but there's you know there's SEM and display marketing. Um, there's um, SEO via you know Download.com and Softonic and the leading download portals out there, um, and you know any other way that you might market packet software. I mean a lot of, you know some of the largest players are doing it via you know offline and things like that. But here there's a, there's a ton of performance marketing um, channels that are available for. Great. Folks with good so maybe it's a good question for Jasmine. Jasmine, you're you're a large publisher. Yeah. Tell, we, us, um, tell us about driving traffic. <clears throat> we acquire most of our users via paid search, and that's really mostly Google because we have this super international base, and that's where the penetration is internationally. Um, we do do affiliate marketing. We work with download portals like Softonic, like CNET. And those actually perform the best for us. Those are users who are going and directing themselves to a download. So they're comfortable with the process. So users that you get from the directories, they perform the best? They do, ultimately, That's in terms of conversion. Great. And your, the way you use a secondary offer network, does that change based on where you're getting your users from? There are secondary offer networks that are um, that have more penetration internationally. As a publisher, or as an advertiser. As a publisher. As a publisher, we have to search and scour for the right um, offers for us. Uh, we have this big Southeast Asia demographic, which is hard to monetize, and we yeah. have to find the right um, either network or single offer that will work for those users. Gotcha. And what are what are some examples of offers that do work in 
in those tough to monetize markets. So toolbars are really what we've found to be most effective and toolbars uh, with, with Google search backend <clears throat> gotcha. because those are, that's what users want to use outside the United States. I think penetration is at 90% outside the United States. Google so, versus other engines. So 90% of the search traffic is coming from Google outside of the US. That's right. That's interesting. I've, I've heard of Google. They're pretty, they're doing pretty well. Pretty big. Last I heard. <laughs> what else, guys? What other, what challenges do publishers face? What are some of the things you have to worry about when you're, you know, when you're thinking about right. partnering with a secondary offer network, when you're looking at the types of advertisers that are available? We What's think important? a lot about balancing monetization with user experience, so not bombarding users with offers and presenting relevant offers. Um, so we do a lot of analysis. We track the funnel from start to finish and, and try to figure out what the best points are to maximize monetization and minimize fall off from the funnel. And we found that to be the installer, our <clears throat> download installer. Mm -hmm. That placement works best for us. So elaborate on that a little bit. So what about that works, works better for you? I think that users are already invested in downloading your product. And within our installer screens, they learn more about what the value of our product is. So um, an offer screen in the midst of that happens to work best. We tried it on the website pre-download as a bundled offer. Mm -hmm. We've tried it after the download on our registration screens. It doesn't seem to work as well in terms of take rate and in terms of fall off. Okay, great, great. So uh, any questions from anybody in the audience about kind of the publishers and, and the challenges that they might have? Got one now? Yeah, I'm a publisher. Um, great. I uh, have a site that is a file uh, conversion site. It elects is about 1,100. We get about 17 million page views per day. Wow. Predominantly US traffic. Yeah, it gets a lot of volume. I've monetized that uh, exclusively through third-party ad networks, CPX, Rubicon, those guys. And so I tend to go to ad tech more. This is my first time at Affiliate Summit. I was trying to see if there's CPA deals that make sense for, for our asset. I come to this, and it seems pretty interesting because we have a download component. So <coughs> how does how do you get started in this? I mean, I know that's a very broad question. No, that's, um, that's, a, that's a great question. So Andrew, that's probably a good one for you to field. Yeah, I mean, I think the first thing you want to do is reach out to one of the reputable secondary offer networks. You know, there are a handful that are sort of leaders in the space. Um, get a feel for their capabilities in terms of the, the way in which they can s support you. There are a couple different models. Um, one where it's a kind of a wrapper around the entire install process. Another one where the secondary offer kind of comes in via plug-in to the uh, to, to the installation process. Um, <clears throat> and you're really going to want to um, get a good feel from the network provider as to um, you know, who their advertisers are, um, you know what their practices are. I think it's really important when you're going to be exposing your customers to third-party software um, that you know you work with someone who's who who, who believe who engages in best practice right, right, um, right. and also you know so that they've got high quality advertisers and they also and also have a strong compliance program uh, both you know to make sure that you're not introducing you know dangerous or bad software to your users or um, you know and, and to keep tabs on everything that's going on with the browsers and um, you know the search players and other yeah. kind of legislation in the market. Is the revenue model typically a, a pay per download, a pay per successful install in these cases? Um, oftentimes. Yeah, um, okay. Yeah, and sometimes a revenue share. A rev I share. think toolbars okay. are more revenue share oriented, right, yeah. in yeah, general? What's your, what is the downloadable component on your site? A tool, it's a toolbar that lets them come back to the site over and over again. Okay. Um, these are users that I think, our, our site doesn't have a, they don't come to the site to download any particular software, but there's toolbars and there, we, we do a substantial amount of toolbar downloads that are catered to our site, but it's, it doesn't use any of this software, it's just a straight download. Link, Got it. So. And, and that toolbar, are you doing that with a, with a toolbar company? Yes, we are. With huh. Conduit or somebody like Conduit, that? Conduit, yes. Yeah, oh, great, great. Yeah, so you know, secondary offers beyond that toolbar can be a, a big help. Right, it and makes a lot of sense. So. Yeah, you can definitely increase your monetization and um, you know, a little bit of protection. Conduit's got a lot of coverage out there, so I'm sure a lot of your users come there and already have a Conduit toolbar. Right. So um, you know, you strengthen that that offer flow, and you know, you can really improve your monetization. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you got it. 
So Next somebody up. was about to ask this, so I'm going to go ahead and do it. Um, Google's going to do a lot of big changes come February 1st, yeah. which is going to significantly impact um, a lot of that stuff that everybody's doing. For example, I've heard that they're going to force opt-in instead of opt-out, which yep. is going to kill everybody's conversion rates. Yeah, um, yeah. It's and it's especially with change. Ask, I know Ask is a Google partner, and that obviously is going to impact you a lot. And I just want to know what you guys think is going to happen and how we can all um, adjust for the changes. Maybe talk about some of the things you know that Google's going to ask for as far as um, compliance and that sort of thing. Right. Um, well, I, I certainly don't want to comment on IEC's relationship with Google, um, <clears throat> but um, you know we are very supportive of Google in terms of ensuring that there is good disclosure and um, you know really focusing on the end user. Um, and I you know I think there are going to be plenty of models, um, despite whatever um, guidelines or, or, or legislation there is that will enable folks to make money um, from toolbars and other bundled software. I think what's the most important is, whether it's a toolbar or another offer or something that you're introducing, it's gotta truly have end user value um, or you know, no one's gonna want it, whether opt-in or opt-out. We have plenty of opt-in offers you know, or different forms of offering them in our network which do really well because the product is, the, the, the nature of the, of the way the product's marketed and the product itself is compelling to the end user. So, you know, we try to do that with the custom toolbars that we build um, for our partners. Um, and, you know, I think that's, that's the way we, 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 we attack those sorts of things. And, you know, I'm sure others do it in other ways. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> we're working with tons of toolbars. And, and this is obviously huge news, kind of what everybody's talking about. And just to kind of answer your question of tactics to go around this. So, um, I've seen already Babylon has sent us their new guidelines where they're looking to force the user to accept homepage and default search. So if you want that translation software, you have to accept homepage and default search. Really surprising, right, that, that, that that's what's going to happen, but that's, that's one tactic that's being used. Another thing that we're looking closely at and I think is going to work well, splitting that toolbar up. So instead of a toolbar offer with pre-check boxes for homepage and default search, three separate offers, one for homepage, one for toolbar, one for default search. And inside, you know, basically those three components are each going to be their own advertiser. And they'll be optimized against all the other advertisers and, you know, different components will be offered and, and sometimes no components will be offered, but that's another thing I've, I've, I've seen. How about Jasmine and Balan? Any, for, any insight there? Uh, for us, um, we have 4 million downloads a month, and the toolbar take rate is close to 50%. So we drive close to 2 million do downloads on the toolbar. The, uh, the way we use the toolbar is uh, the monetization aspect is very important, but we use it in a way to increase the retention of the user and the usage for that user. So the, the, tool, the way we place the toolbar or the, the way we position is, is um, it already offers a great value to the user. What does it do? It turns the software on and off. On, if it detects an unsecured Wi-Fi hotspot, it opens a window um, asking you, prompting the user to turn on the software. It also offers malware protection. So because we have positioned the toolbar uh, a little different uh, than the other partners, uh, it's, it's, it will impact us it will impact us a little differently. And then someone asked uh, in the audience about the toolbar monetization. Uh, I would like to add one thing. With the toolbar, there is a huge uh, potential in monetization, which we haven't mentioned is the notification. So if you have your own partners you, in CPA or CPI partners, whatever, you can use the notification. Uh, notification that comes on the right hand side of the screen and sell that on a CPC basis. And that, that also drives a large amounts of uh, revenue, almost uh, comparable to search. That's us. great. So it seems like a, a good strategy might be really tying that toolbar to your product. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's, you know, I don't think people were taking that extra step. Yeah, make it now. useful. Yeah, good. That's a great point. Jasmine? 
As, as Bachlin mentioned, it's adding value to the, to the offer. Um, and I think it's going to be aggressive A-B testing on offer screens. That's yeah. what we're going to see coming up. But for us, and I think for a lot of other businesses, our base is, is a little bit, we have some US users, but because we're such an international community, ultimately Google is the only search engine that's going to perform for us. And so going with their guidelines is what's going to happen. Yeah, so that's tough. So, so for you, there's no other option. That's true. <clears throat> yeah. Anyone else, anything on this? No? OK. Uh, that answer your question? OK. <laughs> There's no easy answers for this question, unfortunately. All right, so let's switch it over to the, to the advertisers. And, and you know, I don't know if anybody here is an advertiser, but um, there's certainly lots of them out there beyond the toolbar. Anchor Free is one of them. So what, what do you like about advertising via a secondary offer network? Um, Obviously, the audience, it's a very engaged audience. When somebody is downloading a piece of software, they are very focused. And this uh, audience is not you know, passively browsing the web. And uh, this audience uh, also knows that they will be presented with secondary offers. So they don't go ahead and blindly accept whatever is thrown their way. The second is uh, very important for us, scale. Uh, we are piggybacking on the scale of our large distribution partners such as Ask to hit, to, to hit the goal of 1.6 billion uh, users we would like to acquire. The third is predictability, and predictability for us is twofold. One, in terms of volume that comes from our partners. We can rely on our partners to bring the quoted amount uh, allocated to them month after month. And the second thing about the predictability is the impact to IPNL. Uh, because we know we can scale our business on a predictable manner if we have a handle on the costs and the secondary download channels allows us to do that. And I would say the last is ROI. Because the, um, because the cost per acquisition is relatively lower than other channels, SEL, or excuse me, SCM or display, we're able to break even in a relatively shorter amount of time. Great, okay. So the quality of the users, would you say it's the same as SEM, or is it that it's a little bit less or lower, um, but cheaper to get them? They are cheaper to get, but I think for us, the quality is, um, we are, even though we are a product that are intended for masses, majority of our users are uh, techies. So with the secondary download channel, we naturally hit all the techies. And their usage is higher than regular uh, users that we have. So the techies are our power users, and that's who we acquire from the channels that we work with. Uh, we would definitely like to have a bigger reach and go to the mainstream audience, but I think that's going to go beyond secondary channels, and we need to work on our branding and maybe create more awareness for security concerns online and then layer secondary channels for scale. Uh, but yeah, I would say for us much, much, they are the power users, secondary download channels because of the nature, techies. Got it, got it. <coughs> and um, so as an advertiser, what do you have to look for when you're looking at different secondary offer networks? And is there a big difference in quality depending on the, the network? We work with a number of um, very good partners, and we've been lucky uh, about that. Uh, we look at, obviously, besides the reach and the demographics, uh, the reputation of the partner. You don't want to work with any partner who has been associated with malware or spyware. Um, we pay attention uh, to the whole process, how, uh, how we are presented to the user. It needs to be very clear. The user needs to understand exactly what they are downloading, what the benefit is to them. Uh, and, and we've been lucky with the partners we've been working with so far in those. Yeah, Andrew, anything to add to that? I mean, I think, I think Bagalan hit all the major points, but um, you know, you want obviously a network that's got scale, which you said, mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, not just, I mean, I think best practice is, is critical, not just so that you're not introducing um, spyware and other problematic software, um, but um, also to make sure that you're maximizing your yield. We had one partner who was working with a different network that was unknowingly introducing software that was uninstalling their software and changing their settings. So yeah. they were putting their, their users through the ringer and also making less money at the end of the day. So I think you just have to be very careful about you know who you introduce 
to your to your customers. Um, and is it is it normal practice for an advertiser to be able to get information on anybody else that they would be included with? Um, no, I mean as an advertiser. Yeah. So if I'm an um, advertiser, will I know every other no. product that will appear with me? I mean, oftentimes you won't. It'll okay. be blind. Um, that's why I think it's important that you trust the the network provider. Um, one of the things that I think is also important for an advertiser beyond that is um, good business intelligence so that you know they're understanding the distribution that they're getting and, the, and can measure it um, and really a, an effective platform for well a couple things for just testing in general so that you can you know try out different creative and um, and just have to test different channels um, you know to make sure that you're maximizing your performance gotcha yeah. yeah. So, uh, staying on the advertisers. So, we talked about toolbars. We know about Anchor Free. What, who are the other advertisers in this market? There's got to be other kind of important players and important categories that are driving this monetization. Andrew or Jasmine? Who? You know, the two most effective offers that we found are toolbar and antivirus. Um, but we're in the process of looking for advertisers that complement our product uh, to increase the relevance and the value. So we're a video chat community looking at webcam overlays and smiley packs and things that really make the experience of using PalTalk better. Great. Andrew, any other? I think shopping, comparison shopping and couponing are also big categories. Popular. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we, we certainly see a lot of that. And then, um, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot a lot of business out there right now from white space players. So they're doing ad insertion on Facebook. They're doing SERP ad insertion on, on Google and Yahoo SERPs, and they're paying a lot. So what are some of the good and bad things about working with partners like that? So Jasmine, do you want to start? Is that is that a category that you'd get involved with? We really have been limited in our experience with, um, we've been toolbar focused and we've done deals with certain other publishers, mostly antivirus to this yeah. point. So I'll let Andrew take that one. We don't, we don't support those players either. Um, and, uh, you know, I just think it's, it's it, I don't, you know, it's, they, I think they monetize well, but I don't know that they're good for consumers or for publishers um, to the extent that they're replacing, that they're sort of deceiving users into thinking that they're engaging with 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 uh, something, and they're actually engaging with something else. Um, so, you know, like any marketplace, you've got to make choices about, you know, what types of um, pr companies and products you want to work with. Gotcha. Anybody in the audience have any questions on the advertiser side? Anything that we touched on there? Any of the categories? No. Okay. So. We'll I see some sheepish faces. I think we might have some, some white space partners in here right now. So. Um, Didn't mean to offend anyone. <laughs> um, all right, so sticking on the advertisers. Badland, what what are some of the different placements you've tried and, and what works the best for you? Um, we work with uh, from software portals to websites to, to applications and uh, number, one, uh, number one take rate for us is during the installation path. Whenever we are offered uh, either uh, as a stub installer or a, um, or a static executable within the download path. The second is during the installation process, uh, if we are offered uh, on a page, uh, that's almost like an inter interstitial as a recommended software. Uh, we've seen success. Uh, definitely the thank you pages have worked for us. And uh, we also had success on uh, toolbar, toolbar widget placements or notifications. So by that you mean um, buttons on toolbars? Buttons on the toolbar or the notification sent to the user as a, as a recommended software. Got it. And um, so who, if you wanted to try that, who, who's selling those, those banner buttons? Well, I think uh, once you get the toolbar, uh, if you're a publisher, you can actually monetize those uh, buttons yourself. Mm -hmm. You can reach out to your publishers, you can reach out to your advertisers, excuse me, and uh, offer that placement or offer the notification on a CPC basis. Interesting, okay. One, one anecdote, we work with um, <coughs> uh, Avery Dennison, um, so we, we the, the label maker, um, and we built them a custom toolbar that gets downloaded with their enablement software and um, they have a little, we built them a widget that allows you to um, create 
es essentially custom labels from the toolbar, and that happens to be their second largest lead gen channel um, of all their channels um, wow. online. Yeah. So uh, elaborate on that a little bit. So how is that working? Bas it's just like a, 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 a button that's offered that allows you to, like, that'll take you to a page that allows you to create custom templates direct and, and, and order them directly from the, you know, it goes to their, to the place where you go to, to order templates from them. Got it. So yeah. they're distributing this toolbar and then that toolbar is, is basically uh, generating sales for them. Yeah. That's great. So it's a it's kind of a virtuous cycle. And thank you pages. So I know that's a, a big business, right? And I, I'm saw so after download here and, and met with them. Exactly. What, who, who were some of the players in that space? We work with After Downloads a lot. Yeah. Yeah, and they've been a great partner to us. Got it. And is it traditional ad units? Is it traditional ad units or uh, is it? They could be traditional ad units. We prefer to work with traditional ad units because our audience uh, is used to that. We're, we're a banner monetized uh, product. But it can be also um, it can be also untraditional units, rich media, mm -hmm. anything that you know your audience would respond to. And you need to do a lot of A/B testing, multivariate testing to see what your audience responds to. What ours respond to may not be the same as what yours respond to. Got it, Jasmine. How about you? Anything kind of other than you know you talked about toolbars and. Are you trying any kind of thank you page ads? Anything else that you've done that's, that's generated good revenue for you? We actually did a secondary offer test with Softonic recently. And we had one of our major initiatives was for 2012 was localization, um, translated software. And we tried to translate it offer screen with them. And we saw a 62% lift, I'm sorry, decrease in cost per lead. Um, and I think it's important what we've learned in this process is obviously translation and good translations are key. but also, in the images and the look and feel, customizing that for each geo has had a major impact. Got it. Got it. So, Andrew, anything else on that? Or, or any other tips in general for, you know, ways to drive more traffic <laughs> if you, you know, either drive more traffic as a, a software advertiser or generate more revenue as a software publisher? I'm just thinking. From anybody. So, we know there's thank you page ads. There's kind of ads during the process. What else have you seen? Um, updates. Every yeah. time we push an update, we're planning to offer a secondary install or a recommended software. Because we have not been doing that, and we will start doing that every time. Great. Because we push updates almost every two weeks. Wow, so every two weeks, you're going to have an opportunity to monetize that user. Remonetize that. Remonetize that user. That's great. And have you started doing that already? Not yet. <laughs> we will. That's great. So there's a question from the audience. Yeah, qu questions more about uninstall rates uh, uh, with the paths, you know, these, uh, da the download and being a part of a secondary offer versus driving your own traffic through um, search engine marketing or, and even how it compares to the thank you page. Do you see a significant difference in uninstall rates when you're being installed with other software or, uh, or not? For us, uh, like I said, if we are presented as a complementary software, for example, somebody is downloading an antivirus, which protects their desktop, and then we are offered, which protects their web browsing session, we don't see much attrition or uninstall. But uh, also, if the user is aware of what they are getting and the benefit, what the benefit is to them, yes. Also, you need to understand the uninstall rate could be so many things. We have sometimes close to 50% uninstall rates, but when we look at it, we know that because of some update we pushed, the product wasn't working <laughs> properly, and the users have to uninstall and reinstall. But guess what? It's an uninstall rate for us. So. I think everybody's experience is different, but for us, uh, we've been successful so far. How about with the Ask Toolbar? It's got to be a big difference, I would think, between... Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's the, oftentimes the quality of the user, um, and, um, you know, sometimes it's a little bit counter, counterintuitive. Um, you know, you focus on people that are, that are you know, big consumers online, um, and not sometimes the, the overly techy audience doesn't perform as well mm -hmm. um, just because folks you know they 
they get they you know don't you know they get they like to try things out and and uninstall things and you know they're always looking for the next thing essentially yeah and kind of staying on the toolbar side so <clears throat> any tips for just distributing via a bundle you know what's the best way to present the toolbar is it branded for your product is it you know, I see, you know, the example we showed before was just a plain mm-hmm. ask toolbar, which has a lot of good brand equity to it. What's delivering the best results for you and your partners? I mean, there, there isn't one good answer to that because it's like, it's different in every channel. I mean, as I said earlier, you really want something that's got benefit to the end user. So sometimes that's a feature that comes in every toolbar, like our Facebook widget we think is quite compelling. Uh, but then other times, um, you really want, as, as Bhagavan's saying, you want something that's going to tie, and we've all said, is going to tie the, you know, it's going to create some ca- causal connection between the primary piece of software that the user's downloading and the toolbar. So that comes via customization and really, you know, we do a lot of work with um, some of the AV companies and, you know, building in, building security into the toolbar um, is, you know, a nice value add that pe- that users generally like. Yeah. And uh, so, Jasmine, when you, as a company, decide to participate in this network, are you taking any risks? Is there anything, any downside there to kind of, <clears throat> to monetizing these users? I think there is a, a brand risk associated with um, if the user uninstalls your product and then notices that, you, that your product dropped these other things on their machine, there's a, clearly an issue there. Um, we actually, to answer your earlier question, we did a Paltalk branded ass toolbar and a plain ass toolbar, and we didn't see a significant difference in the monetization. I suspect, I'm not sure of this, but if your brand has wider awareness than ours does, I wonder if monetization is better when you have a branded toolbar in that case. Yeah, and um, so it seems like Balin had a lot of success when the toolbar had a lot of the product components in it, right? And is that something that you tried, or was it just a We a haven't had that close connection between the toolbar and the product yet, but having heard her sort of anecdotal um, response rate, I think it's something we definitely need to try. Yeah, great. All right, so, um, so let's move on to kind of industry-wide topics. So um, one of the big challenges that we deal with all the time, I'm sure everybody out here and, and all of us do, is the browsers, right? And it's totally changed in the last few years. You used to just have to worry about IE. Then it was just IE and Firefox. Now it's IE, Firefox, and Chrome. And they're updating every two weeks. So how do you, how do you manage that? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of like an arms race in today's world. You have to, I mean, if you, you either have to have you know, a lot of resource internally and, and a team of, of folks that are getting out ahead of the releases um, or uh, you know, work with someone who does, um, but it's definitely become a challenge. Um, uh, it's, I think it's one of the things that differentiates a lot of the companies in the space because you know they've got you know that's what they do, um, and so that's kind of a, a, a large value add. Um, you know, with installer, for example, like working with a company that can manage your installer is is a benefit because you don't have to you know keep tabs on on everything that's happening with the browsers. Um, the other thing I'd say is obviously the browsers are, are tightening down in terms of uh, ensuring that software, you know, that end users understand when software is being installed and, and, and or settings are being changed. Um, and, you know, ultimately I think it's a good thing because it's, um, you know, protective of the consumer, but um, um, it certainly kind of puts a point on everything that's being said that you really have to focus on building, you know, a product that users want. Um, otherwise, you know, the product's going to get caught in, um, in, in one of the uh, confirmatory screens that's um, required by the browsers. And how about, how about you guys? So, Jasmine, is it a, something that, you know, do you see big dips in performance from your offers? And are, is the browser landscape having a, a big effect on your business? Not that we've noticed. I know that Chrome and mobile are really the only browsers that have gained <coughs> share. Not that mobile is a browser, but those are the only places that have really gained share in the last, I'd say, three years. I, I don't know how those monetize, how one browser monetizes against the next, but it would be interesting to find out. Mm-hmm. And Balan, for you, anything? For us, uh, because we are an infrastructure 
We are browser independent, so it's more uh, in terms of operating systems versus browsers for us. Okay, so that leads us to a, a natural next question, which is Windows 8, right? And um, you know, I haven't seen too many people talking about Windows 8 and, and what it means, but uh, how have you guys prepared for Windows 8 and, and the different experiences that, that are available on it? Um, I know from our perspective, we're creating a really full screen experience, sort of an, a, a proxy of our tablet app for PCs. And PC is really the bread and butter of our business. So um, we're going to have to be aggressively testing what that offer screen looks like. And, and along with the Google compliance changes that are coming our way, trying to figure out how to best present that screen and, and it, it reevaluate the touch point um, where that offer goes in our flow. And uh, Andrew, is, is the download experience going to be very different on Windows 8? Uh, fundamentally different. Um, you know, it's a closed system, so you have to go through the, uh, through the store, um, and, and applications you know, don't interact with each other. So you know, it's, a, it's a fundamental shift um, in downloading, um, at least the metro view. Um, there's two views. There's the desktop view, which is, sim which is the same thing that you experience today um, and the other um, OS's and then you've got the Metro view which is more of a tablet like experience um, and or it's meant for tablet type usage um, so I you know I think that well, first of all the there's hard to say how well it's being adopted at this point but I think it, you know I see the Metro view as something that's being more used in a um, tablet type environment um, you know, when you want a touch screen and those types of things. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, I think there's, there's, there's some new and interesting ways to leverage search in these environments. Um, so we've got a bunch of things that we're prototyping that, you know, we don't feel a need to distribute to kind of release at this point because the adoption, the current adoption is so low at this point. Mm -hmm. And anything you could kind of share with us specifics wise? Would it just ways to though? integrate search into very into applications and tiles, um, you know, other things, adding functionality that might be missing that people want um, as part of the experience, yeah. things like that. Cool, great. All right, so we only have a few minutes left before we start our Q and A. So, um, you know, start with some, you know, let's do a pretty broad question, which is, how do you see the download space evolving? Let's start with you, Bala. I would say, say um, the, the major change will be on the mobile space. Uh, people will be, be, because of the usage of our product, uh, we, will, we, we don't have a, a clear way of interacting with other mobile apps when, if you are on a, on a, a tablet or a smartphone. And that is our challenge, and that's what we're working on. So the, the, definitely the space is shifting to mobile, and uh, we have to make some adjust, adjustments on our VPN uh, in order to catch up with that. Mm, interesting. And Andrew, do you see mobile as a big part of what's going to become the download business? I mean, absolutely. Um, I, I guess the way we, I look at it is slightly differently, which I, you know, there are closed operating systems and open operating systems. Um, so. You know, obviously, with mobile, Android is an open system, um, and you know, ultimately, if you look at the history, it's the open systems tend to win out. Um, and if you look at you know how fast Android's been growing, it, that seems to be where this might all play out. Um, and you know, so in an open system, you really have the same opportunity. And what I mean by closed is again, like Windows 8, pushing someone through a through a through a specific place to download software. Um, but the, you know, as far as the open systems go, I think there are you know there are a number of compelling ways to um, simulate a you know given that we're in a panel about secondary offers to kind of simulate uh, the experience that on PC in mobile in a way that's you know beneficial to to users, um, but also c can support meaningful monetization. Um, and you know we've been working on some things with a couple of our partners and uh, you know we're excited about you know those opportunities and f you know frankly I don't think I mean at least at this point desktop isn't is still growing I mean maybe PC shipments aren't but usage is still growing you know and mobile seems to be additive to that um, but in, in any event you, you know you have to shift uh, but I think there's going to be plenty of opportunity there 
Yeah, and is there a, a toolbar solution for mobile? Is are, are, are companies making money through toolbar toolbars on mobile? People are making money through mobile search. Yeah, um, uh, you know, the, so it might not be a toolbar, but there are other ways to generate search traffic via mobile. So if you're a, if you're a product and you're being downloaded on mobile, can you use a search partner like Ask to monetize those users? Yes. Um, ultimately, I mean, we've we're, we've been building um, something in, um, for the past while, and um, we're going to be releasing something in beta soon um, that will allow you to monetize your 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 mobile downloads with an Ask powered solution. That's great. Yeah. yeah. And, and what else, Andrew? Do you see is, is kind of the evolution of the download space? I mean, I think those are the like in terms of the way the things that we're focused on. You know, browsers and OSs and mobile seem to be. Um, the big changes, um, and uh, you know, so I, th I think we kind of hit hit the nail on the head. Yeah. Great, Jasmine. How about you? What's what's next in the download space? Sure. So echoing what everyone else has said, um, the percentage of our downloads has really shifted towards mobile in the last year and a half, and we use toolbars to fray the acquisition costs of paid marketing. Um, acquisition costs f on mobile have increased. I think. They've doubled over the last year in our case, and I've seen some documentation of this online. W W3, I did a study recently um, that sort of confirmed what we were seeing. As, P as there's more competition for paid distribution, those costs are going up, and we don't really have a way to monetize users. And churn is obviously just higher on mobile products. Yeah. Um, so having a, a bundled offer there could really increase the value of those users. I think also in terms of the compliance changes, it'll be interesting to see what happens with um, download portals uh, because as, I've, as I understand them now, the, the policy says that um, toolbars can only be distributed via the publisher themselves and not via download portals. So if you're a, a soft tonic, then potentially you can no longer distribute a toolbar. That's, that's how I understand it now, but you know, as we've been discussing it and as we've been talking to other people here, those, the policy is a bit fuzzy still. There's no, we don't have like a confirmed, um, and it seems to be different case by case, so. Okay, right. So yeah, that, that's interesting. But um, you know, I think the other thing to, to note there is, it's not changing for everybody, it's really just changing for Google, right? So it's, it's opening some big opportunities for, for a lot of non-Google companies. So it'll be interesting to see how that all shakes out over the next three weeks. <laughs> yeah. So great. So I think that's it. We've left a little bit of time here for some Q&A, um, about 10 minutes. So um, if you have a question, just please head over to the microphone and um, ask away. Got one taker, here we go. Can you be more specific about ways that one can monetize mobile search? Um, well, I mean, we're, it's, it's, we're not out with it yet, but just ways to um, add search to the to a user's device. Um, so, I'd rather not get into the specifics till we're kind of out in the market with it. But yeah. I saw something pretty interesting today, which was um, it was an Android application, and what was being bundled with it was a lock screen app. So it branded the lock screen for this particular company, and at the top of the lock screen was search box. And it was interesting, and I thought I think it was the, the kind of the most like what we're currently doing um, that I've seen in the mobile space, and it makes a lot of sense. And um, you know, I know that's something that that we're looking at, which is, you know, just like your computer, your phone has a default search function, and and I think just like computers, there's going to be a battle for that, and you know, I think it's going to start happening really soon. So you know, the lock screen was the first kind of thing I've seen at it, but I imagine you'll see a lot more people, you know, when you download PalTalk, being asked, do you want to switch the default search of your phone to ask or whoever it may be. Anybody else? By the way, I think you can only do that in, in an Android. Android, yeah. 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 <clears throat> All right, so uh, I think if that's it, then um, we'll call it a wrap. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you.